All right, we'll get started with, with what we're doing today. So we're going to continue on with, with more uh, Chapter 8 topics related to ideal gases. And so today we're going to talk about what's called Dalton's Law, which deals with mixtures of gases. And then we'll also talk about the kinetic molecular theory, which deals with the sort of atomic and molecular uh, aspects of, of gas samples. Um, one thing I'm going to start reminding you guys about is occurring one week from today. So April 12th. Um, this is going to be the only bonus quiz that I announced because it's the day that we're going to do the, the course evaluations and I really want as many people here as possible. And the bonus quiz that we do on the 12th is just going to be participation only. So you get the points if you're here and you know enter an answer. And it's going to be a survey that's very helpful to me also for some things I'm thinking about working on this summer. So it'll be a win-win-win situation where you'll get to come and get a bonus point, you'll get to come evaluate my teaching, and um, I'll get some important uh, survey information from you guys about some things. So April 12th, and I'll send an email about this so that you know, you're know you reminded again, um, but that's going to be happening one week from today, so that'll be uh, important that as many of you are here as, as are able to be. All right, so with that, we'll start with what we're doing today. So we're going to start with just a couple of thought experiments, I guess you'd call them. Um, last time we closed with a problem on gas stoichiometry, and the very last thing we did was calculate the total pressure after the reaction was over, and we had a mixture of two gases left in the, in the reaction vessel. We had you know, an excess reactant and a product. So we're, we're going to continue on that theme today in talking about mixtures of gases. So let's suppose the first question here, we're just going to have you guys shout out the answer. We're not, not going to do this on a clicker or anything. Let's say you have a flask that's filled with one atmosphere of N2. You add an additional one atmosphere of N2, and then what's going to be the total pressure? Shout, shout a letter. Don't be shy. All right, I'm hearing a lot of B. So that one's pretty straightforward, right? We just have two atmospheres. We, we start with one atmosphere, we add another atmosphere, the pressure is two atmospheres. Now let's suppose we have a flask with one atmosphere of N2, then we add in two atmospheres of O2, so a totally different gas to the mixture now. But the, assuming the two aren't going to react with each other, what's going to be the new pressure when we have a mixture of N2 and O2? So in the second one here. All right, a little bit more uncertainty this time. Take your best guess. All right, I heard a few people say it. So C is correct. So it doesn't really matter if it's the same gas or two different gases. When you mix two gases together, the pressures are additive. All right, so that's kind of the first key concept that, that deals with mixtures of gases is that pressures are additive. And gases mix homogeneously, which means really any two gases we can mix together in any ratio. So we know that, you know, the air, air is made up of about 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen roughly with a few little minor things in there also. And we also, you know, we should realize that air is not, the composition of air doesn't change as you go to different elevation, it doesn't change drastically. So the, you know, the composition of air at the floor is the same as the air at the ceiling. The two gases are mixed homogeneously and they're completely interdispersed with each other. And then the other important point, which is the reason why we have this behavior where the pressures are additive, is that each gas in a mixture behaves as if it's by itself. So in other words, there's no interaction between the two different gases when you, when you mix them together. Now this is true for what are called ideal gases. We'll get into more detail today and next time about what it means to be an ideal gas. But if you have two gases mixed together, they don't even really see each other. They don't interact in any way. They don't. So the you know the properties of the N2 molecules when they're by themselves are no different than the properties of the N2 molecules after you add the O2 to the mixture. There, there's really no effect. They, they behave as if they're by themselves in each case. So those are some of the things, and that leads us to an important relationship, an important law called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures, which is basically can be written in a bunch of different ways with different equations, and which one we use is dependent on the situation, I suppose. Um, but Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures deals with mixtures of two or more gases. All 
life. So air being the classic example of a mixture of many different gases. And if you want to, there's a few ways of writing the equation, as I said. So basically what the law says, and, and kind of what we got into on that first slide, is that the total pressure of a gas mixture, P total, is going to be the sum of the individual pressures for all the, the gases that are in there. So if we have, you know, call them A, B, and C, if we have three gases, or however many we have, you just add up the individual pressures, and that's going to give you the total pressure. And these terms here, the PA, PB, PC, and so on, those are called partial pressures. So each gas in a mixture has a partial pressure, which contributes to the total pressure that's observed for that sample of gas. So when you have, you know, the atmosphere at one atmosphere pressure approximately, part of that one atmosphere of total pressure is from the nitrogen, part of that one atmosphere is from the oxygen, and then a very small part is from everything else that's in there. So anytime you have a mixture of gases, there's going to be contributions from each gas towards the partial pressure, and those individual contributions are called the partial pressures. Now we can rewrite this simple equation here in terms of the ideal gas equation. So remember that from the ideal gas equation, pressure is equal to nRT divided by V. Okay? So we can rewrite this total pressure as the moles of the first gas times RT over V plus the moles of the second gas times RT over V and so on. And as we got into then in that last problem we did on Monday, the total pressure only depends on the total number of moles. So if we have a mixture of gases, it doesn't matter what each individual gas is, it just matters the total number of moles of those gases we have. And the other important point is that when we have a mixture of gases, they're going to be at the same temperature and they're going to occupy the same volume. So we can factor out the number of moles and just say it's the total number of moles times RT over V. So that's a way to write it in terms of moles. And then finally, we have a new parameter called mole fraction that we're going to introduce now, which allows us to calculate the partial pressure. So let's say we have the total pressure. We want to calculate the partial pressure of a certain gas that's in that mixture. We can use that, this equation here, where the pressure of A, for example, is going to be chi times the total pressure. All right, so another Greek letter to add to the mix. This chi is what we call mole fraction, and it's going to be the moles of A divided by the total number of moles of gas. All right, I don't think we've seen mole fraction in any other context. You might see it in Chem 2 dealing with certain solution properties. But for us, this is the only way we're going to see it is in terms of a mixture of gases. The mole fraction is the fraction of the moles of one gas divided by the total number of moles of gas that are in that mixture. So that's called mole fraction again, to remind ourselves. And if we want to prove that this relationship is true, remember that from above we have total pressure is equal to the pressure of A plus the pressure of B plus the pressure of C. We have three gases, for example. So if we rewrite all of these partial pressures in terms of their mole fractions, chi A times the total pressure plus chi B times the total pressure we can factor out all those mole fractions And just like mass fraction, which we've already talked about, the sum of all the mole fractions has to be 1. So if you have a mixture of 2, 3, 4, however many gases, the sum of their mole pressures is equal to 1. So this kind of hopefully proves to you that this equation is valid. So that the important equations are going to be sort of you know this one here, and then this form of the equation is going to be important as well. So I'll put a box around it just so you're able to zoom in on it. But the rest of this information all gives you some ideas of where these come from, and then this is a little proof for that last one, showing that if we add up together all the partial pressures, that does in fact equal the total pressure as we, as we sort of started with, bringing us back to where we started.
Okay, so that's Dalton's law of partial pressures. Now let's see some types of problems where we would use it and, and how we apply this, these equations and these concepts uh, in, certain other, in certain situations. All right, so let's say we have a mixture of two gases. We have 40 grams each of O2 and helium mixed together, and the total pressure is 0.9 atmospheres. What is the partial pressure of O2? All right, so in other words, out of this 0.9 atmospheres, what contribution does the oxygen make to that total pressure? All right, so anytime we're trying to find partial pressure, we're trying to find the partial pressure of O2 that's going to be the mole fraction times the total pressure. All right, so we need to find both of those terms. The total pressure is given to us. So remember that mole fraction is defined as the moles of that gas, in this case O2, divided by the total number of moles. We only have two gases in our mixture, so the mole fraction is going to be the moles of O2 divided by the moles of O2 plus the moles of helium. Okay, so that's going to be how we calculate mole fraction. So we need to find the moles of each gas, and this is going to be a calculation that we've now done millions of times. The moles of O2, we have 40 grams of that. The molar mass of O2 is 32, two times the atomic mass of oxygen. So we have 1.25 moles of O2, and then finally we have the moles of helium, which we also need as part of our mole fraction calculation. We have 40 grams of helium as well. And the atomic mass of helium, helium is not a diatomic, it's just an atomic gas, it's one of the noble gases. The atomic mass of helium is 4. So we divide the, the mass by the molar mass, and that gives us 10 moles of helium. So when we calculate mole fraction, we get 1.25 moles of O2 divided by the sum of the two, 1.25 plus 10 moles. We get 0 0.111. So the mole fraction of O2 is 0 0.111, which another way of interpreting that is that 11% of the moles in our gas sample are O2. So then we multiply the two, the mole fraction, which is a unitless quantity, times the total pressure, which is 0 0.9 atmospheres. And we get a partial pressure for O2 that's 0 0.0999 atmospheres. So what this shows us is that even though we have equal masses of each gas, 40 grams of each, most of the pressure, most of the partial pressure comes from helium because there's more moles of helium. So just like a lot of concepts in chemistry, the important quantity is moles here, and the number of moles of each is going to determine the partial pressure, not the grams of each. So the mole fraction of O2 is, is pretty low, so that means the partial pressure for O2 is also quite low, even though by mass the two gases are present in equal quantities. All right, so that's how we sort of use Dalton's law. Um, now another application of Dalton's law is going to be towards gas stoichiometry. Um, I don't know if you guys actually do this in the lab. Probably not. It's a little bit complicated. But let's describe the experiment that we can, where we can use Dalton's law to help us measure uh, the amount of product that forms in a chemical reaction. So basically we have a setup like this. So I'm going to number some sections here. So over here on, on the left, and the two things we're heating is, don't, don't worry about the identity of the substance. And basically what we're doing is we're doing a chemical reaction over here, typically by heating it up with a, with a Bunsen burner of some sort. So we're doing a chemical reaction over there at the, in the test tube that produces a gas. So this allows us, so this, this apparatus I'm going to explain to you is allows us to take the gas from this chemical reaction collect it and measure how much of it is formed. Okay. So the gas then is going to be transported into the collector. So it goes through this closed system. Remember that gases, you know, they flow freely. So the gas is going to move from here and it's going to go into this collector here through that tube. So the gas is transported to the collector. And then finally, in the collector here, which I'm going to label as number three, the gas displaces water. We measure that displacement of water as a, as a means of 
determining the volume of gas. All right, so, we, so the gas bubbles come in, they displace water, and then our headspace at the top gets bigger and bigger as more gas fills this, this volume here. And the other important point is that because this is conducted out in the atmosphere, the opposing pressure is going to be whatever atmospheric pressure is. So the pressure of this gas is going to be equal to the atmospheric pressure because we have atmospheric pressure pushing down on the outside, the gas pushing down on the inside, and they're going to sort of equalize each other. So the pressure of the gas is going to be also equal to the atmospheric pressure. But an important point about this is that when we collect the gas over here, we don't just have the gas itself. And this is where Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures come in. When we collect a gas above water, we also have some water vapor, some gas phase water molecules that are contributing to our total pressure. So that's what we call the vapor pressure of water, something we'll talk in more detail about in chapter 9. And you'll also see it probably in chemistry too as well. But the vapor pressure of water is that when you're collecting this gas above a sample of water, there are some water molecules in the gas phase that contribute to the total pressure. So water molecules escape the surface of the liquid and create a small partial pressure and, uh, that, that contributes to the total pressure of that sample of gas. The vapor pressure of water, the, what that actual value is, is temperature dependence, and then we'll again see in more detail later. So, for, for, so at a given temperature, there's going to be some partial pressure of water that's always going to be there above the sample of liquid water. So some portion of the water molecules are going to go into the gas phase, and that gas phase water is going to create a small partial pressure that contributes to the total pressure in our system. We have to account for that then if we want to figure out what percentage or what portion of this pressure is caused by the gas that we're producing in the chemical reaction. All right, so the best way to understand all these things put together is, again, to see a sample problem. So let's say we want to produce acetylene, C2H2. You've probably heard of acetylene torches. You can produce this by taking calcium carbide, a weird ionic compound that has the formula CaC2. We haven't seen carbide compounds before, but that's an ionic compound. We add it to water, and then via this chemical reaction, it reacts with the water to form acetylene and calcium hydroxide. So if we, want to, so if we have a sample of acetylene collected over water at 23 degrees Celsius, the total pressure is given to us is 738 torr, the volume is 523 milliliters. If the vapor pressure of water is 21 torr, how many grams of acetylene are produced? All right, so a lot going on here. But the idea in this problem, in, in problems like this, is that we're collecting a gas above water. So the total pressure of that gas is going to be the pressure of whatever the product gas is, in this case C2H2, so that's the gas that we're producing in the chemical reaction. But then that total pressure is also going to have a small contribution from the vapor pressure, the pressure of H2O itself, okay? So if we want to find the pressure that's just attributed to the product that we're interested in, C2H2, we have to subtract it. So we're going to try to find the partial pressure of acetylene, because that's going to then allow us to calculate moles and anything else that we want to calculate with it. So our total pressure is 738 torr, as told in the problem. The vapor pressure of water at this temperature is 21 torr. So again, a pretty small, a pretty small value, but not insignificant. So the, the partial pressure of acetylene is 717 torr. Okay, so if we want to calculate then the grams of acetylene that are produced, the first thing we can do is use the partial pressure of acetylene to figure out how many moles there are. And so remember, if we have the pressure, and we have the volume, and we have the temperature, how do we calculate number of moles? So the whole theme of this chapter is what we call the ideal gas law, right? So if we want to calculate the moles of C2H2, we're going to use ideal gas law, pressure of C2H2 times the volume that it occupies divided by RT. And remember, if we're using the ideal gas equation where we're including the value of R in our calculation, 
we need to make sure that the pressure and volume are in the correct units. So the pressure needs to be in atmospheres. So the pressure of acetylene is 717 tor, as we just calculated, by subtracting the water vapor pressure. And then we convert that to atmospheres. That's 0 0.943 atmospheres. The volume needs to be in liters. We're told that we're collecting 523 milliliters. So if we want to use the ideal gas equation, we have to convert that milliliters into liters. We divide by 1,000, 0 0.523 liters. R is the universal gas constant, 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres per k-mole. And then for any gas problem, temperature needs to be in Kelvin. The temperature is 23 degrees Celsius, so we add 273 to that, and we get a temperature of 296 Kelvin. So when we calculate the number of moles of acetylene, we get 0 0.0203 moles of C2H2. So that's how many moles of C2H2 we have. And then finally, the question is asking us how many grams are produced. So to get the grams of a substance, once we have the moles, we just multiply by the molar mass. Right, so the grams of C2H2 0 0.0203 moles times the molar mass, which was given to us as 26.04. So that's 26.04 grams of C2H2 for every one mole. And so this corresponds to 0 0.529 grams. Okay? So again, once we have the number of moles, there's a lot we can do with it. And the key to this problem, as I said, is to remember to account for the water vapor pressure. Every other, every other thing we did, we've already seen. We know we... We have, a, you know, we have a pressure of a certain gas, we have its volume and its temperature, so we use the ideal gas equation to calculate the number of moles. We take the number of moles and convert it into grams. Those things we've already seen before, the only difference here is that when we're calculating the pressure of that gas, we have to use Dalton's law to account for the fact that the total pressure is the sum of the C2H2 and water, we have to subtract the water vapor pressure. So when you guys do problems like this on the homework assignments and the exams, very often there'll be multiple choice, and you'll have two answers that are very similar to each other. One of those answers they remembered to subtract the water vapor pressure, and one of those answers they didn't. So if we had forgotten to do that, we would get an answer that's not too different from this, but a little bit different. And so a significant portion of you will pick the answer that doesn't include accounting for the fact that we have to subtract the water vapor pressure. So, so prove me wrong, but I know that's gonna be the, this is going to be a step that a lot of you forget when you're doing these types of problems. So you're always going to have two answers that are very close to each other because this correction for the water vapor is pretty small overall. All right, so that's how we deal with that in, um, in that type of problem. And then we can take it a step further. So same problem. If we assume 100% yield, how many grams of the calcium carbide, CAC2, were required to produce that amount of acetylene gas? All right, so this, at this point, is just a stoichiometry problem. We're done with all the, the gas laws part of it. So we're just looking for the mass of reactant that could produce that much product. So as we found in that first problem, we, we produced 0 0.0203 moles of C2H2. We could have started with the mass that we calculated, but that would have been an extra step. We already calculated the moles of C2H2 from the ideal gas equation. We look at the balanced chemical reaction, and, and C2H2... For every one mole that forms, we're reacting one mole of calcium carbide, so this is a one-to-one -one mole ratio. And then if we want to find the mass of calcium carbide that that corresponds to, the molar mass of calcium carbide is 64.1 grams, which is given to us at the beginning of the problem. So that corresponds to 1.30 grams of calcium carbide. So if we want to produce that much acetylene, we have to dissolve 1.30 grams of calcium carbide in water, which will then react with the water to form that much acetylene. 
All right, so as I, I promised, stoichiometry wouldn't go away, so here it is again just to see how it can be applied to these types of problems. Okay, any questions on that before I move on to the, the new stuff? All right, so the next thing we're going to do is talk about what's called the kinetic molecular theory of gases, KMT, which deals with gases at the atomic or molecular level. So we've been talking about all these properties of gases, which are macroscopic properties, the pressure, the volume, the temperature, number of moles, all those things. How does this relate to the behavior of individual gas molecules or, or gas atoms or whatever the case is? So there are four postulates of the kinetic molecular theory of gases. Again, depending on where you read this, you might see it divided up in different ways. But I'll, I'll show you sort of four key points about this. So the first is that the volume of the particles themselves, the molecules or the atoms that make up the gases, is assumed to be zero. Now we know this isn't rigorously true, so we'll see why this is important, why this assumption breaks down in some situations later on. But the kinetic molecular theory assumes that the gas particles have zero volume, which means that they're essentially what we call point masses. So the gas particles have, um, they have mass, but they don't have volume themselves. And another way of thinking about this postulate is that when you have a sample of gas, the vast majority, or to this limit, 100% of the space is just empty space. The volume that's occupied by the gas molecules themselves is incredibly tiny compared to the volume of the container. So in other words, if we were to take all of the gas molecules in this room that you guys are you know, breathing in and breathing out as we speak, if we take all those gas molecules and just gather them together and press them all together, the volume of those gas molecules would be extremely small compared to the size of the room. So that's what this first postulate tells us, is that the molecules themselves essentially have no volume associated with them. The other part that's very important is that gas particles are in constant random motion. All right, and this should make sense based on a lot of the properties of gases we've already talked about, mainly that they you know, they completely fill the space that they're occupying, they're freely flowing, they mix together quite easily. All those things is because the gas particles are in constant random motion. And then when we measure pressure, which is that key parameter of gases that we've been talking about a lot, it's caused by collisions of the particles with the container walls. So when we measure pressure of any, any sample of gas, for example, the pressure in this room being very close to one atmosphere, it's cause, because as the gas particles fly through space, eventually they're going to hit something. They're going to hit the wall or whatever, and that's going to cause a pressure on that surface because the, the gas particle has motion and it has mass associated with it. So that's what causes pressure is the, the random motion of the gas particles, and they're hitting the wall with some frequency. Another important point of the kinetic molecular theory of gases is, is that the particles exert no forces on each other. Right, this is also one of those things that's not, none of these are rigorously true, um, especially this one. We'll see later on how this is not exactly true for a lot of real gases, but the kinetic molecular theory deals with ideal gases, sort of in the limit of that ideal behavior, and it states that there's no forces of the gas molecules on each other. And then finally, an important one here that we'll talk in more detail about a little bit later is that the average kinetic energy of the particles is proportional to the temperature. Of course, the temperature has to be in Kelvin for this to be true. So what that means is that if you have a higher temperature, you have the particles have more kinetic energy, which means they're going to collide with the walls more frequently. 
and with each other more frequently, and those collisions are going to have higher force. All right, so in other words, when you heat up a sample of gas, the particles start moving faster and faster. They're going to hit the walls more frequently, and they're going to hit the walls with more force. And that's going to be related then to some of the properties, as we'll talk about now. So let's try to see how these postulates of the kinetic and molecular theory relate to the ideal gas law that we've been talking about. So we talked about the, the relationship between pressure and volume, which can be termed Boyle's law. And from the ideal gas equation, it's going to be pressure is equal to nRT times 1 over volume. So we saw that the pressure and the volume were inversely related. So let's think about what happens if we take a sample of gas and we compress its volume. How does the kinetic molecular theory tell us what's going to happen to the pressure? So we know from this equation that the pressure should go up, so why is that? So when the volume goes down, the gas particles are going to collide with the walls of the container more frequently because they have less volume to move through, so they're going to hit the walls more often. So hopefully that makes sort of intuitive sense. The collisions become more frequent. We're not changing how fast the gas particles are moving, because that only depends on the temperature, but if we change the volume, there's going to be more frequent collisions of the gas particles with the container, and the pressure is going to go up because of that. So remember that the pressure is caused by the gas particles hitting the walls. If, the, if they're hitting the walls more often, you're going to have more pressure. Okay, so that's how the that, that property is related to Boyle's law, the inverse relationship of pressure and volume. We also saw that pressure and temperature are related to each other. So again, from the ideal gas equation, moving everything to, else to one side, if we're at a constant volume, the pressure is directly related to temperature. So this tells us that as the temp pressure goes up, temperature goes up, and vice versa. So let's see what happens if we take a sample of gas and we raise the temperature. Okay. So if the temperature is increased, as we talked about, the particles are moving faster. So that's the key impact of temperature on gas molecules, that the particles start moving faster. And then the collisions with the walls of the container become more frequent, because if they're moving faster, they're going to, hit, they're going to run into the wall more often. And those collisions have more force associated with them because on average, the gas molecules are moving faster. So if you raise the temperature of a sample of gas, it hits the walls more often and it hits the walls harder. And so that should hopefully tell us then that the pressure is going to go up as well when you raise the temperature. Okay, so all of these relationships in the ideal gas equation are related to the atomic or molecular nature of gases. And in the case of temperature, when you raise the temperature, the gases move fa the particles move faster, and that also then leads to an increase in pressure. We can rationalize some of these other relationships as well. Volume and temperature, which is, you know, Charles's law. We also saw that the volume is proportional to temperature. So if we take a sample of gas where the container wall can move, where this, we have a movable cylinder in this case, where the volume is adjustable and the pressure is constant. So the temperature, if we increase the temperature, Again, same effect. The collisions with the wall become more frequent and more forceful. And so the volume expands because these gas particles are going to be pushing up on this cylinder a little bit harder and they're going to, they're going to raise the cylinder up and increase the volume. And that volume has to increase if we're working at constant pressure, as we are in this situation. All right, so if, if, the, if the pressure is constant and we raise the temperature of the gases, they're going to move faster, they're going to hit the cylinder, and they're going to expand the volume to keep the pressure constant. So that relates as well. And then finally, Avogadro's law, which I think is probably the most intuitive one, which is that volume is proportional to number of moles. So we have a container of gas here. We inject in some more gas. So we add more, the number of moles goes up. So if we have more gas particles in our container, we're going to have more collisions. In this case, we're not changing the temperature, so the gases aren't going to be moving faster, but if we just have more of them, they're going to collide with the walls more frequently. And so again, the pressure temporarily raises, which then the, I mean the volume has to go up to keep the pressure constant. Or in other words, if we have 
a movable cylinder like we do here, if we add more gas molecules, they're going to hit the cylinder more frequently, so they're going to cause it to raise up, and the volume's going to expand. So all of these relationships that we can derive from the ideal gas equation relate directly to the kinetic molecular theory. Um, so it kind of brings us back to some of the very basic stuff we talked about at the beginning. The ideal gas law is a law. It's a description of, of, of you know, commonly observed phenomena and relationship between properties. And then the kinetic molecular theory is an explanation for that law, which goes down you know, at the molecular level to explain how gas molecules behave and how when we change those properties, it, it influences the macroscopic properties that we observe as well. Okay, so hopefully that kind of makes some sense to us. Now we're going to talk a little bit more detail about the effect of temperature on the motion of gas molecules, which is another important aspect of the kinetic molecular theory that we need some more details about. All right, so we, we're going to talk about, our, about what are called molecular speeds. Um, so when you have a sample of gas at a certain temperature, um, as it turns out, we're not going to have all of those gas molecules moving with the exact same velocity. Some are going to be moving faster, some are going to be moving slower. There's always going to be a distribution of speeds for a given sample of gas. So any sample of gas will produce, will, will possess a distribution of molecular speeds. All right, so it's impossible to, you know, measure the temperature of a gas and know exactly how fast a molecule is moving. You can just know sort of the distribution of speeds in that sample as related to temperature. So let's look at how those distributions change for different situations. So let's say in the left here we're going to have the same exact gas in every case, but we're going to change the temperature. So at some arbitrarily low temperature, we're going to have a distribution of speeds that look like this. All right. So the blue one is going to be low temperature. Now when you have this distribution of speed, so the y-axis is the fraction of molecules with that speed, and then the x-axis is the speed itself, the velocity or speed. Um, and so you're going to have this peak here. This peak here is the most probable velocity. That means more gas molecules have this velocity than any other one, but there's always going to be a distribution of, of speeds that are present in that sample. They're going to range from you know, really slow to pretty fast, and there's always a range. Now, if we raise the temperature, as we talked about, on average, the gas molecules are going to move faster. So basically, when you raise the temperature, the peak shifts. If it's the same sample of gas, the area under the curve has to be the same, so it's basically going to broaden out. You're going to get something that looks like this. So this green one will arbitrarily call the medium temperature. So if you raise the temperature a little bit, you're going to shift the distribution of molecular speeds. On average, they're going to be faster, so the peak shifts to the right, but you're still going to have a distribution, and it's going to be a wider distribution um, when you go to the higher temperature. And then finally, if we go to what I'll call the high temperature in red, you can shift the distribution even more. So this, one, this red one is going to, we're going to call the high temperature. All right, so that's what happens when we change the temperature of a gas. And an equation that we'll see in more detail is that the temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy, which is equal to one-half times the mass times the average of the square of the velocity. So whenever you see a bar above something, that means average in this context. So as we increase the temperature, the average speed increases, so the peak moves from, from left to right. As we, as we go to higher and higher temperature, and you're going to have a, a broader distribution the higher the temperature you go. Now let's see what happens if we have a bunch of gases at the same temperature, but they're all different types of gases. So they're all the temperature is the same for all of these, but we're talking about different gases. So let's start with O2. Again, the scale is very arbitrary here, but if let's say we have a sample of O2 that has this distribution of speeds at a certain temperature. Okay, so blue in this case is going to be oxygen. Now let's see if we compare oxygen to helium. So remember, the difference between oxygen and helium is just the mass of the particles. Oxygen has a molar mass of 32. Helium has a molar mass of 4. So helium is a lot lighter than oxygen. So if we have helium at the same temperature, this equation tells us that the kinetic energy will be the same, 
Well, the kinetic energy depends on mass and velocity. So for a lighter gas, it's going to have to have a higher velocity to have the same kinetic energy. So that's going to shift the distribution to the right for helium. All right, so they're at the same temperature, but for the lighter gas, you need to have a higher speed. And then the same thing happens if we go even lighter to hydrogen, which is even you know, twice as light as helium, molar mass of two. So hydrogen, the distribution will shift further to the right. So as you go to lighter and lighter gases, the speed has to increase if the temperature is the same, the average speed. All right, so at a given temperature, lighter gases have a higher average speed. And that's because for that temperature, the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy has to be the same. But when the mass is smaller, the velocity needs to be higher to give you the same value for the kinetic energy. All right, so there's going to be some conceptual questions about that on the homework. And the key points are that the, the average, sorry, the average kinetic energy depends on the temperature, but then the average speed which is related to kinetic energy in this form is going to depend on the identity of the gas at that given temperature. Okay, so let's look at some equations then that deal with this, this concept about molecular speed and temperature. So as I said, the average kinetic energy is a function of temperature, and the exact equation for that is 3 halves times R over Avogadro's number times the temperature. So R is the gas constant. N sub A is abbreviation for Avogadro's number. So this is the average kinetic energy for an individual gas particle. So if we're trying to find the kinetic energy of one molecule of gas, on average it's going to have this value, which is just a pretty simple function with two constants and a function of the temperature. Now we also know from, if you are taking physics especially, that average kinetic energy has the equation that I gave you, which is one half mv squared. I think your book uses u instead of v, so don't be confused by that. Um, I sort of am wishy-washy on which one I should use, so um, if you don't like v, use u. It just means speed or velocity, don't get confused by that. And they look very similar when I write them anyway, so you're not going to be able to tell anyway. Um, but it's m mv squared for uh, one half mv squared for the average kinetic energy. And so we can set the two equal to each other. One half times the mass times the average of the velocity squared is equal to three halves times r over Avogadro's number times the temperature. All right, so let's multiply both sides by Avogadro's number to get rid of... Um, some things, but first I forgot to define some of the variables, which should be obvious. T is the temperature, and then this little m is the mass of an individual particle. So before we rearrange this, let's make sure we're clear on what all the terms mean. So m is the mass of an individual gas molecule or, or atom, and then this, again, this average v squared is the average of the squares of the molecular speeds. So if you're a stat whiz, you'll know that there's a technical difference between the average of the squares and the square of the averages, which, you know, there's, but that we're not going to worry about that detail in this class. But basically, this is just the average speed squared, okay? We don't need to worry about the, the minor details about the statistical distribution aspect of this. So anyway, we're going to take this equation here and rearrange it by multiplying both sides by Avogadro's number. So we get one half Avogadro's number times mv squared is equal to 3 halves RT. And then something we should recognize from our, since what we know, we know what Avogadro's number is, if we take Avogadro's number and multiply it by the mass of an individual molecule, that's going to give us the mass of an entire mole. And what do we call the mass of a mole? The molar mass, right? <laughs> Duh. Um, 
So if we take Avogadro's number and multiply it by the mass of each individual particle, that gives us the mass of one mole of particles, which we call the molar mass. So that allows us to rewrite this and solve, where we get the average of the, of the square, the speed, is 3RT divided by Avogadro's number times the mass, which is equal to 3RT over the molar mass, which I'll abbreviate as MW. If I just use M, that's going to be confusing. And then what we get is what's called the root mean square, which is the square root of that. So VRMS, which again has a slightly different meaning than average, but we're not going to worry about that, is 3RT divided by the molar mass with the square root around it. All right, so we have that equation for VRMS for a sample of gas. Now we're not going to really use this very much. Next time we're going to see how we really use this idea um, to derive another equation that's a little bit more useful for us. But let's just do an example of it just to see what we kind of get for um, a, a typical gas. So let's say we have argon gas. Argon is a very common gas used in chemistry laboratories. And we want to know what's the RMS speed for a sample of argon gas at 17 degrees Celsius. Now one thing that's really annoying about this equation, which um, as I said, we're not going to really use it a lot, but I just want to give you an example of how we use it here. You'll see in the homework that it's not really going to be used in this exact form, is that the units are a bit different than what we're used to. So something we'll see a, a little bit uh, coming up now is that there's another value of R that's in joules, which is 8.314. So we've talked about how there's a relationship between liter atmospheres and joules, and if you convert R into joules is 8.314, and anytime we're calculating anything that has to do with physics, so things like speeds, like we're doing here, you have to use that value of R. You can't use the universal gas constant. So that's the first thing. So we have to put that value of R into the equation. We still have to use temperature in Kelvin. So the temperature is going to be 17 degrees Celsius plus 273, which is 290K. And then finally, we need to use the molar mass. Now, this is where, again, the units come into play. This is in joules. Joules is related to kilograms, not to grams. So we need to have the molar mass in kilograms per mole. Um, so we need the molecular mass or the... MW is abbreviated in kilograms per mole for this equation to work. So we know that the atomic mass of argon is 39.95 grams per mole. That's the number that comes from the periodic table. We have to convert that to kilograms by dividing by 1,000 because if we're using that value of R with, in terms of joules, we have to use kilograms as our mass unit. We'll see later on that the form of this equation that we're going to use most often doesn't have this annoying requirement of using kilograms. So this is not going to be something that rears his ugly head very often. Um, probably not at all in the homework. Um, okay, so we divide the two, take the whole screw to the whole thing. The whole thing is under the square root. And we should get, in, the, the answer will come out in meters per second. Again, it's not obvious if you're not familiar with these units, but 426 meters per second. Now to put that number in context, here we have a sample of gas at room temperature and the average speed is 426 meters per second, which is about 900 miles per hour. So this shows us that even at reasonable temperatures, gas molecules are moving really, really fast. But like I said, we're not going to use this equation in this form very often. We're going to talk about next time how we actually will use it to talk about other properties of gases.